Hi everyone, um, welcome back to Still We Persist, um, IO Women's of Color Initiative, um, one of our programming for the Hattie Revan Women and Gender Center on campus here at OSU. And if this is your first time, welcome. Um, I'm here alongside my coworkers, um, Shina and um, Benasia, and we're missing Maya today, but um, Maya's having fun. So <laughs> we'll see her on another episode, but um, I'm going to pass it to Shina for our land acknowledgement. Thanks, Jada. Oregon State University in Corvallis is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Indigenous people are valued contributing members of the Oregon State community and represent multiple sovereign tribes among students, faculty, staff, and alumni. AYA accepts its responsibility for understanding the continuing impact of that history on these communities. We are committed in this spirit of self-reflection, learning, reconciliation, and partnership to ensure that Oregon State, as an institution of higher learning, will be of enduring benefit, not only to the state of Oregon, but also to the people on whose ancestral lands it is now located. Data, I will pass the mic back to you to uh, introduce our topics for today. Yeah, thank you, Shina. Um, so today's um, sort of a special episode. Not really, though, um, but um, I am in a class writing 327, and we are actually doing, uh, I guess, a thematic um, assignment over the whole course of the term where we picked a community and a problem they're facing. And um, it actually happened to correlate with the work I do with Aya. So I figured it would be a perfect opportunity to kind of pair those along <laughs> together. Um, so today we're going to talk about the toxicity and the detriments of social media um, among women of color in terms of beauty standards. Um, more specifically, um, I guess how social media can be toxic to the lives of women of color um, because we're compared and I guess just how society is with Eurocentric beauty. Um, so I guess first question, um, or I guess I'll give some context first. Um, for the assignment, um, I guess I just have to kind of describe um, what the problem is and the community and then also the solution I have. So um, that'll be progressive along this whole episode, but um, I will start with a question for everyone here. Um, first off, um, we're all women of color and, um, you know, we use technology so normally now um, more than ever. And that includes things like social media platforms. Um, so first off, I guess I want to ask like, what social media platforms do you guys use, if at all? Sure, I can start because I'm in the like mostly no social media category. I um, I deliberately I was pretty much only using Facebook. I am like in the age group where when I first got on Facebook, um, it was only for college students. I was like in 2006 and. And in 2017, I just decided like it was, I was spending too much time scrolling and comparing my life to what like the curated version of my friends' lives on Facebook. So I shut down all of my social media accounts then. And pretty much my only engagement is um, if I'm helping with IA social media. Now I am on social media a good amount. Um... I'm on, I have Snapchat, Twitter, those are my two mains, then like TikTok, and I have Instagram. I never post on Instagram, but I do like Instagram, and then like Pinterest, um, but yeah, I'll let you ask more questions, and I'll go more into it. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I personally do have social media as well, um, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, um, pretty much everything but Twitter. Uh, but 
Um, I, I have gone through a social media cleanse lately um, because I found myself the same boat Shina was in. Um, I just, I found myself just like relying on it way too much and just the muscle memory and checking it all the time is kind of crazy how it just like consumed my whole life. So um, I, I deleted it for about two months, which sounds a little lousy, but um, I've definitely seen improvements. Um, the first week was definitely hard because um, I was just finding myself trying to go on it. But now um, I find of myself being less reliant on it. So that's good. Um, I mostly use it for programming purposes like you, Shina, and um, sometimes when I'm bored, but I don't want to get into that bridge anymore <laughs> of where when I'm bored, that's when it happens. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate both of your guys' answers on that. Um, and in terms of my community, um, the community I'm mainly focusing on is obviously women of color um, who don't fit Eurocentric beauty standards. Um, and in that case, for me, like I am an Asian um, Chinese American woman. Uh, I came straight from China, but I grew up here in the US. Um, so I guess that'll be my next question. Like, what is the community that you guys came from? Um, most specifically, like, your ethnic background, um, just so we can get some context on that. Um, I would love to hear. Okay, I can go first again. Uh, I My family is South Asian specifically, both my parents are from Bangladesh. I was born in the United States. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I mostly lived in communities that were predominantly white with um, very few other, I guess, like in very few people of color around me at all. Hi, well, um, I'm Black. I'm African American. I came from Fresno, California, born and raised. Um, and because of how Fresno and the city closest to it, uh, Clovis, are compacted uh, or just how they mesh together. Fresno is not a predominantly white place. It's, I, I grew up with a lot of other students of color and we were the majority of like schools and stuff. I may have been the only like black kid in classes, like some classes, like history class, I hated being the only one or it'll be like me and two others. But um, yeah, you definitely saw it on like when we went to lunch and everything, like you, it was predominantly uh, students of color, so yeah. It's a wild ride here. Yeah, um, I also came from a community. Um, I've always lived here in the US pretty much um, up until I was one years old when I was adopted. But um, I guess I was in the town of predominantly white people as well, just like China. Um, B sort of had a similar situation, um, but I guess it's definitely like coming here, it's kind of a culture shock, but I don't, I don't know essentially at the same time because it's definitely more diverse than the town I came from. But I mean, OSU is still a PWI. So um, there's, there's that to it. And um, I just wanted to get into the problem um, a little bit more, I guess, in um, more depth. Uh, so we talked about the communities we're from and the community of social media being women of color um, as my target, I guess, population and community. But um, I really want to get down to the root of the problem. And um, I would love to hear what Shina and Benesia say about what they think the problem is. Why is this a problem? And um, I don't know, you guys can just come up with this on your own discretion. Um, if you need more time, that's OK. I can go still. Um, but really just talking about the problem, I mean, why is this a problem among women of color? Uh, I'll go for that. Having media being um, so Eurocentric, I see the problem in women of color hating themselves. You see the apps where like Snapchat has different filters where it makes your face smaller, your nose smaller, your eyes a different shape, all this other good stuff. And you see like women that there's women 
bleaching their skin. There's women doing a bunch of different things. Like they'll wear different hair. Like even like a lot of women wear like wigs, but like that's not to change your hair. But some women actively will not like wear their hair the natural way. It's not even because they don't want to. It's physically because they just hate it there. And it's like it creates a self hate that like women probably would not develop if that wasn't the normal way that like people have things. Yeah, um, I'm, you know, I'm doing a PhD in women, gender and sexuality studies. So I talk about similar things all the time. And I could probably like, <laughs> I could probably just keep going for a while. Uh, but I, I'm thinking of a mix of like colonialism and capitalism. So as, um, as like European cultures took over and colonized cultures around the world, right? They, they were very invested in seeing themselves, like Europeans, as, as superior to everybody else, right? So that, that includes the way that they look um, to, be, like, to, to, to be better specimens of nature kind of meant that like they were superior and were justified in taking over other cultures, right? Um, and in the United States, we're, you know, we're, we're still colonized by a like government that's based in European ideals. And there's a blend of like companies needing to sell more and more products, including beauty products, um, you know, reinforcing or like making up the idea that women need to shave their legs or need to use like certain hair products or you know whatever whatever market they're finding that is untapped they'll create a need right um so you know mixing like the fact that european beauty standards came over to to this continent and the fact that like companies need to just be like expanding their market um i'm seeing like you know, a, a lot of ways that women of color would feel pressure to buy things like, uh, you know, like hair straighteners or something like that. Hopefully that was a coherent answer. Yeah, um, Shina, that was really original. I never thought of like, I guess, capitalism along with colonization. That's actually really thoughtful. And I think along with the point of like, colonization, it brings up a great point where um, just along with like our lengthy history in the United States, um, obviously there are still a lot of white people who are the majority. And um, I think with that comes a lot of like idolization and kind of like, I guess, fitting in and conforming to what society finds to be like normal or trendy. Um, a, specifically on social media. Um, and I think that brings up a lot of issues because not everyone looks, not everyone is white, not everyone looks the same. Um, we're increasingly becoming more diverse, just um, at least I'm hoping that too. Um, but um, just in the social media world, um, it's crazy because we see these large influencers. And um, I'm not sure if you guys know what the term influencers is. Um, it's a relatively new term. Um, basically, um, younger people specifically, younger white individuals are making careers out of social media and being content creators. And they have the term influencers, um, maybe because it sounds more like professional or something, but influencers who are setting standards um, and I see it kind of being detrimental to mostly women of color because when that, when the influencers become the idolized thing, then it kind of just creates this more divide of between like, it's kind of like a hierarchy essentially, like women of color are kind of like down here and then they're being idolized at the top. So that causes a lot of problems because even B brought up some like, there's people bleaching their skin. There's people trying to conform to what society thinks that they should be looking like and acting like and stuff like that. There's no authenticity to it. So um, I think that brings up a lot of issues like 
um, mental health disorders and eating disorders. And um, there's, there's a lot of studies on specifically why social media is detrimental just to um, beauty standards and things like that. But women of color are already put at a disadvantage in terms of like society standards. So I think it just creates um, even more divides. So um, that's my really lengthy answer. Um, do you guys have anything else to add um, to it? Um, I, you know, I can always keep talking, but I'm, I'm wondering if you will have certain questions for us that will kind of get to what I'm thinking about anyway. So maybe I'll just wait. I hope so. Um, <laughs> uh, in all honesty, I didn't really prepare questions, so I'm just kind of letting things go with the flow. So those of you who are watching, you're on for a wild ride. <laughs> um, but we kind of talked about the community and why we think it's a problem. Um, so I guess we, we came down to it. We identified the women of color community and why it's really a problem, but something we haven't really talked about it's kind of like the solutions where where do we go from here how does this how do we like counteract this into not being a problem so um again um i don't know if you guys want to answer if you have any insight if not then i can still go and then maybe if you guys want to say something but do any of you have insight for me i don't know if i have insight but i definitely have thoughts um so even though I don't use social media a lot, I still read articles in the news about like trends in social media, right? So I was thinking about, I think it was maybe four or five years ago when some um, white and lighter skinned women on social media were posting pictures of themselves with like unshaven legs, right? They were like, they were basically resisting the, the patriarchal need to like not have, have body hair. And there was like, I, and I don't know who the praise was coming from. I don't really remember, but like they were kind of, um, these women who were posting pictures like that were considered to be like revolutionary and they were, you know, fighting the patriarchy and like, you know, women who are from like women whose ethnicities kind of mean that like, we just have a lot of body hair. We were kind of like, um, if we weren't shaving, you all would call us disgusting. Like if we tried this at any point, you know, you, you would think it's not cute in the same way that you think these like, you know, white women are cute for, for not shaving their legs. Um, and I, I was, I was really happy to see that there was so much pushback on I guess like the praise for white women, not, you know, it's totally cool if, if they don't want to shave their legs, but the culture like applauding them when they would would not have applauded you know, like black and brown women for doing the same thing. Um, I was I was really glad to see people were pointing out that discrepancy. And you know, it's it shouldn't be our responsibility to to call people out all the time, but it is empowering, I think, to see other people saying, um, you know, saying that like, this isn't fair, that these like, you know, body, um, like these ideals are, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? It's like, not hypocritical, but you know, there's like, there's definitely an inequity happening here. Um, so I, you know, I think like, Social media also gives us the platform to say these things when we wouldn't have been able to without you know, some place to like post about, about these things. Uh, honestly, don't know a solution. I know for me, I have actively, cause at some point like, all teenagers, when you had social media, mine ended up being like very um, white woman centered. And I remember like trying to find hair and like styles and being like, there's no way I could do that because she's literally just throwing her hair in a bun and my hair does not go into a bun fast at all. So I, I don't know how to do that. And at some point I was just like, this isn't good for me. So I started to actively make sure my social media was of people that look exactly like me, or not exactly like me, but look similar to me. So they had the same hairstyle, kind of like 
it's like more black people there's more women there's I'm not the skinniest person in the world so I there's not skinny women on my thing like I have more people of color on mine and it just makes me feel better because it makes me feel like this is like I'm the norm and I kind of forget that people's um, social media doesn't look like that every so, every once in a while somebody will send me something and I'm like where did you see this or they won't know something that like TikTok has different sides to it and I'll say something from TikTok and people will be like I've never heard that and like I thought it was trending yeah thank you both for your really thoughtful responses um Shanna I I really do think there's a double standard when it comes to things like that um it kind of reminds me not to not to throw this in um because I love Taylor Swift but kind of reminds me of her song the man where um she basically just sings about how if she was a man this this wouldn't it would be it would be fine but um being a woman it makes it oh she's she's not she's just like looking for attention or oh something like that so um there is definitely a double standard and I see that um within our community as well and then um B um I do I do like your solution as well um just surrounding yourself with people who make you feel good essentially and people who you identify with and feel a sense of belonging um too but um in terms of this assignment um I We'll just bring up my solution that I came up with. Um, definitely more of an evidence-based one rather than like something that I would have rather <laughs> came up with, um, as weird as that sounds. So, um, but one of the problems I came up with that was really backed up by evidence um, in research um, was implementing media literacy into educational systems and for those of you who don't know what media literacy is, I didn't really know what it was. Um, it's definitely not something common that's taught in schools, but essentially media literacy is, I guess, um, it can look multiple ways, but basically the intent of media literacy is to be able to educate people on different forms of media, whether that's like social media or whether it's like a photo or whether it's a commercial and kind of just identifying um, I guess things like bias um, and just being able to really interpret that, um, basically finding people's intent, um, biases, but being able to kind of understand why, when, what, how media is created and kind of just finding a deeper meaning into that. So um, essentially what in my paper I argued was media literacy, if it's taught to everyone, um, possibly people will be able to interpret certain medias as being faulty. Um, for example, um, B, you brought up Snapchat filters earlier. Um, they're becoming increasingly really natural looking, um, which kind of concerns me a little bit, but things like smaller face, slimmer nose, bigger eyes, you know, these Eurocentric beauty standards and their income or they're becoming really natural looking like it looks like that's how people normally look and it's a little concerning and um, I think if we were able to implement media literacy into schools um, we'd be able to kind of depict those things and know that it's real versus edited or what the intent of something is I mean um, I think now more than ever there's a thing of misinformation and um, that's a big theme in the world right now so I think implementing media literacy specifically would be able to not just like educate our white counterparts, but even like the women of color community, um, just to kind of see like how everything is not what it seems on social media, essentially. Um, like one thing could even be depicting a picture and seeing what's real and what's fake or something like that. So that's kind of the solution I came up with I want to get off my little platform here because I want to have equal air time for everyone. And um, I'm unaware of the time frame of this. I don't know if we've gone over the time or not, but um, I don't know if you have anything, Shina. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're good on time. Um, I think we've been recording for about 20 minutes. So okay. We're, we're 
And since I'm unmuted, I guess I can I can say something. Um, I it makes sense to me. It seems like media literacy is has some overlap with critical thinking, maybe as a component of critical thinking, right? Being able to understand uh, what what goes into creating a, a piece of media. Um, and another another way we can maybe like increase the odds that people are are becoming more media literate is um, I, I know there are like YouTube channels and uh, Instagram profiles. I don't know the words. Um, there are people on Instagram who will show how they altered a photo or like how they did makeup to make themselves look really different. So you're seeing exactly the process of changing yourself to meet certain beauty ideals, right? So even if even if a school refuses to introduce or like implement something like media literacy, which seems to be the case because a lot of schools don't like critical thinking, uh, hopefully more and more people, especially like young people are coming across these comparisons so that they can see exactly like what the reality is versus the filters or the, the makeup. For sure. Um, B, did you have anything to add to that? Um, adding it to schools, I don't know how far it would get because schools aren't even teaching students how to do taxes yet. Um, so it kind of gets thrown into the world kind of wild. And the other thing, uh, being able to tell that a photo is edited will help a little bit, but there's also some things that become trends that I just remember students of color being uh, bullied for when they're younger. Like the Kardashians do a lot of uh, things that when like, I know black students that were younger get that got bullied for things that the Kardashians do now that are so popular, like having big lips and like having a big butt and that kind of thing. I remember students of color being like uh, bullied for their eye shape and now just call it a fox eye thing. And I don't know how that would help. I mean, we can add more stuff into it, but I think it would just be people just being decent humans. I don't know how to explain that part though, but it's just wild how things change. Yeah, B, that's a really good point. Like, even if you can see, okay, not everybody meets the ideals, that doesn't erase the fact that the ideals exist. Um, and I, I guess, you know, maybe we can talk more about the body neutrality movement and, um, you know, people talking about the fact that your value isn't, it's not, it shouldn't be correlated to your appearance, right? So I, I think that that's been helpful for me at least. And, you know, like some of my peers and, and my students to think about like, um, I can just, I can detach the way I look and the way people react to my appearance from my worth. It's, you know, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be a correlation between the two. Yeah, really thoughtful, both of you. Um, I really wish I could have just been like, screw all people. We just need to love each other. <laughs> as weird as that sounds. Um, I needed something with research based evidence. So that was the best I could come up with. But um, in terms of, I guess, more along the lines of what B said, um, I really do think it's weird how, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's an effort of just like trying to diversify the world, but maybe it's also just still us idolizing influencers like the Kardashians, like the Kardashians have such a big influence of the world like everyone knows Kylie Jenner's name everyone knows Kim Kardashian's name like it's kind of crazy and how I guess we as a society and I see a lot of women doing it too just like watching their every step and wanting to be like them and things like big lips you know those are like that's common to get lip fillers now like that's crazy but um and it's things that you know black people are getting hate for and have gotten hate for in the past. So it's just interesting to see um, how our world has shifted. I mean, 
I really don't think, I guess I really don't think media literacy will solve the problem. Essentially, I think it comes with a lot of just like historical and generational factors, just like developing alongside us. Um, but I guess that brings me to, I wanna hear more about you guys. Um, less of my assignment, just talking about it. Um, but I guess I wanna hear, I know B has shared a little bit of um, her social media life and um, how her experience is with social media. Um, and I know, Shina, you don't really go on social media that much. Maybe if you just want to talk about like your life, um, kind of like how you did that write up for me. But um, I guess in your experience, like why, why do you feel pressured and why do you feel lesser because of social media? Like what is your experience with these platforms? And if not a social media platform, just in your life, um, maybe being surrounded by other white European centric beauty standards. Like basically just tell me your experience <laughs> in a summed up version. Um, for social media, I've already said the me switching my social media to look more like me, I I just recall being actively confused that I I recall being frustrated because I'm trying to sit here and look like people who I would never look like and had no uh, no need to look like, and so I was just like, there's no point in trying to figure this out when I'm like I can just sit here and look at my features and figure it out and like how I like what my face looks like and how I like how I look in these certain clothes or like my kind of style and for to be in a PWI it is different it was very much a cultural shock because I'm not from a PWI schools like I went to Fresno like it's predominantly white everywhere but like that one was like the closest to feeling like oh like there's students everywhere like I met all different types of students of different backgrounds and I kind of love that and coming here it's difficult um it's a lot of the stairs or like I talked to somebody in the my hair was one way one day and then like the next time I saw that kid my hair was different and he acted like I had just discovered my hair because he had just seen it and I was like no this is not how this goes so it's weird being here and getting like stared at and being like what is this person looking at and then having to remember that I am different to them but like I'm not different to me so I don't know I don't know what I did. Uh, I feel like I could have a lot of different answers to this question, and I'm not sure where I want to start. Um, Jada, I think I, you know, I wrote up a little bit a few weeks ago, and I think I talked about. Um, kind of like the, the generational differences in um, like beauty standards in my family. Um, so in, in Bangladeshi culture, it's pretty common for like my grandmother's generation and, and like, you know, elder than that to, um, to like value women who are not very skinny because I, it, it seems like it's because we would make better mothers, um, you know, we would like be able to bear children. Um, so, you know, I've like, I was skinny for like a very short amount of time in my teenage years. And besides that, like I've, you know, I've been maybe chubby would be the word for my body type, not sure. Uh, but like my grandmother and her friends just thought like I was adorable and um, they, they would have been very happy to see me <laughs> like my grandmother's friends would have been very happy to see me end up with their grandsons but um the like other generations in my family i i think i, I feel more pressure from them to conform like maybe to slightly more american standards for body type and beauty and and it's not necessarily anything that anyone has said to me but um you know all my cousins are very good at being you know ultra feminine and I am not the type at all. Like, I don't know how to do makeup. Um, I dress like 
fairly androgynously, right? And I just get very self-conscious when I'm in family gatherings because it just seems like everybody else is so good at looking like the people that we see in media. And I am not interested in looking like that, but compared to like all my other girl cousins, I just feel inadequate in that way. Um, And, you know, I think it's probably like we've picked up on these American standards because our, our, our culture, if you go back a little bit is, is pretty different. Um, Yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah, Shana, you bring up this like feeling inadequate and just like self-conscious like that that is what I feel a lot of times um I'm sure B that's the way you felt too before um your social media kind of switched up and you kind of made that action to do that um for me it's kind of like I back up back up sorry guys back up um I guess essentially I would just look at myself in such a dark light. And I don't know if dark light is even a thing or if that's a paradox. Basically, I would just look at myself like I was, my my body and my self-esteem was just so low. Like, and I think that's partially the reason why I went on the social media cleanse for what, two months? Not even that long, but um, just, just a matter of two months, it's definitely helped, but um, I find myself idolizing these influencers. I'm definitely part of that um, sort of party, but um, I would start idolizing them and just like saying, oh my gosh, I don't look like them. Oh my gosh, I'm fat. Oh my gosh, I hate my nose. And just like constantly ripping on myself. And obviously that's not good for anyone, but I guess for me, it's just like, I am an Asian woman. I naturally possess these features. I should be like in love with the person who I am. And um, I guess I don't want to bring up any sort of like toxic positivity, but more sense, just like self-acceptance for my own body. And um, we talked about Instagram filters earlier. Um, Definitely don't try to use those at all, just because they distort your face so much. Um, Definitely don't use any sort of editing apps. Um, I'm starting to be okay um, with how I look. And um, I guess just embracing my authenticity as a Chinese American woman. So um, I guess those are my experiences, but it is kind of sad to think that there's so many women of color, even younger women of color, um, I guess they'd be girls, but (laughs) younger girls who are also um, different races and ethnicities that are potentially like thinking these same things, but they're so young and um, just, I guess it's sad to think that they would think that they're so, I guess, lesser um, than their counterparts, but um, that is what I have. Shina, I probably should have asked you this before, but um, I don't know how long we usually film if it's more of like 20 minutes or an hour, because I feel like we've definitely gone over at this point, if it was. It really depends. It, it, it's just like how long our conversation goes, it's how long it goes. Do we want to wrap up? Um, do, you, do, you, do you have anything else you want to add? I thought... Um... A club that I have to go to, not like a fun club, but like a, uh, well, I guess a fun club. Yeah, I have a meeting to go to at four. So if we want to wrap up now, I'm down for it. But if you guys don't want to, we can keep going. I can always go late. It's not like I have to clock in. Okay, um, I, I don't have a whole lot more to add, but I'll just, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, Jada, I'm really glad you brought up toxic positivity because, um, you know, we, I, I do hear a lot of messaging about accepting our bodies, which is, you know, for a lot of people, I think that's very helpful, but it can also be hard for people who have disabilities to hear that because, you know, they, they feel like, like maybe they have chronic pain or something, right? They don't necessarily want to accept that about their bodies. So especially if you're 
a person of color or like a queer person who already isn't meeting body standards and you also have a disability, like that toxic positivity, um, like messaging can be really hard to hear. So uh, I appreciate that, that you mentioned that. Yeah, um, that is a good point, China. Um, I think toxic positivity, I see it a lot with influencers who are just like, oh, love and acceptance. And they preach all these like wonderful things, but they're being really contradictory in what they post and what they say. That's beyond just like, you know, their daily life. They, it's like what they continually do. Um, that is kind of detrimental. So that's a whole nother topic that we can get into. Um, I will wrap it up because um, I have covered all my assignments. Um, I love you guys, but this is also for an assignment. So um, hoping I get an A. So if you're watching this professor, no, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but yeah, we went over um, the community, the problem, our own experience and a solution. Um, so I have all of mine. Excuse me, I have all of my requirements um, for my assignment, but um, I really appreciated you guys all being here. Um, thank you guys for watching if you made it this far and <laughs> um, be on the lookout for other Still We Persist episodes coming out. Um, you can always um, watch our past ones on our YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I have. Everyone, thanks KVBR for producing this for us. <laughs>